This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making from two Canadians. We're hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital. Episode 212, and I think uh, we were talking kind of off mic at the end that this is a heavy one, and indeed it is a heavy one, but it is an amazing conversation with Professor Ralph Koyen, who is the AQR Capital Management Distinguished Service Professor of Finance and Fama Faculty Fellow at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. Incredible yep. conversation about, I mean, one of the things we talked about was demand-based approach to asset pricing. And even that, just saying that kind of makes your head hurt to think about it. But when he described it as basically thinking of it as the Amazon of money moving in markets and the amount of information that is out there that they're able to capture, it is wild. I mean, you could ask questions all afternoon. You mean the Amazon because they see where the flows of, of like the goods flows, are going? You know, as yeah, he said, yeah. you know, if you're in Chicago and you bought a hat and a scarf, well, you might want a jacket or whatever. They kind of know based on what you own, what you might want to buy. Well, the same thing he talked about learning from fund flows in the market. Oh, it's, it's incredible. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a new approach to asset pricing, which, uh, I mean, hey, when we talked to, when we talked to Fama, he, he said it had kind of stalled, right? Or was that? I don't know if that was on our podcast or a podcast I listened to. Anyway, th- this is a, this is a whole new a whole new way of looking at uh, at asset prices and what causes changes in asset prices. Um, so we talked about asset demand systems, and we talked about inelastic markets, which, as you'll hear in the conversation, are related but slightly different. And there's some nuance in there in terms of the micro and macro f- effects or levels of inelasticity. Um. But if you're uh, tired, you might want to skip this episode and listen to it later. It's, you have to, it's, it's heavy. You it's have heavy. to pay attention. You got to pay attention. Um, and I, we, like you said, Cameron, at the end when we were just chatting with, uh, with Ralph before he, before he left, I said that. I said, this is, your stuff is heavy. Like it was, it was hard to prepare uh, which questions to ask you. And he just kind of laughed. And he's like, yeah, <laughs> I know, it's heavy. Uh, but it's new and it's, uh, it's important. Yeah, I agree. So Ralph has his undergraduate degree in economic econometrics and his PhD in finance from Tilburg University. Um, and he's also a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research and a research fellow at the Center for Economic Policy Research. Yep. All right. Uh, anything else or should we go ahead? Let her go. Here's a conversation with Professor Ralph Coyne. Ralph Coyen, welcome to the Rational Reminder podcast. Uh, well, uh, well, thank you so much for having me. Ralph, what is demand system asset pricing? Um, okay, the idea behind demand system asset pricing is that what we typically do um, um, is that we're trying to understand sort of like prices and, and characteristics of firm fundamentals together. So we oftentimes like form factors based on characteristics sort stocks into portfolios and try to understand why certain securities have high or low expected returns. Now, one sort of like piece of data that we typically don't use, at least in testing models, um, is look at portfolio holdings. And so the whole idea behind demand system asset pricing is to try to understand uh, jointly like uh, the behavior of asset prices, uh, portfolio holdings, and like firm characteristics or macro fundamentals. And so the reason why uh, why we think that's sort of like relevant is that there's a lot of questions that we are like thinking about nowadays that involve changes in quantities. So let me just give you a couple of examples um, just to set the stage. So if you think about the whole transition from like active to passive management, and then that involves like large flows of capital. And we're sort of wondering what does that do to, to prices? Uh, similarly, if you think about all of the growth in like ESG investing, again, Large flows in, in uh, large change in flows, and that impact. And the question is like, how much does that affect affect prices? Also, in the context of QE, similar questions about sort of like central banks buying large amounts of assets or quantitative tightening, not like reinvesting like those assets. And then all of those questions, really, what you want to have is a model or a framework that allows you to think about like a shift in quantities, shift in holdings by one group of investors, and then how does that affect sort of like asset prices? And in the standard model, there's, of course, answers to those questions, um, but sort of like, like we haven't really tested those dimensions of, the, of, those, of those models. And so the whole goal of demand system asset pricing is to just bring together or develop models that simultaneously explain prices, characteristics, and portfolio holdings. Hmm. 
what what would the hypothesis be on the shift from active to passive? So typically, sort of like the um, taking a little bit of a step back. So I think the overarching theme is that uh, what standard theories imply is that models are what we refer to as like being very elastic, meaning that if you get a shift in demand from one group of investors, then 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 other investors are very quick to to step in, and as a result, prices don't move a whole lot. Um, and and so what the data seems to suggest is that demand is a lot less elastic than what is implied by our standard models. Hmm. Now, to make that sort of a little bit more concrete, perhaps, and now I'll get back to sort of like the active passive um, uh, question. Like like where this may be so very familiar to all of us, uh, if you if you solve sort of portfolio choice problems, think about mean variance, or you try to sort of fit like a timing model, then without sort of imposing like additional constraints, you get like very extreme portfolios because very small changes in expected returns lead to like very big shifts in, in your portfolio weights. And sort of that feature is sort of also part of asset price models. And so as a result, um, like if you get, I don't know, you get small shifts in or, or shocks to demands, like other investors quickly step in, almost no impact on, on prices. And so you need like very large shifts to really have a meaningful impact on, um, on valuations. And so if markets are instead sort of like inelastic, then smaller movements in, in, in flows or demand shocks have a larger impact on, on prices. And then you can sort of apply that to like specific questions, like one of them being the transition from like um, active to, to, to passive management. Um, and so in that context, like one of the things that we have done, which is joint work with uh, Moto Yogo from Princeton and Rob Richmond from uh, NYU Stern, um, we sort of like like looked at, first of all, like how sort of like, like if you look at sort of like a measure of like how, how active the industry is, all of the all of institutional capital, one way of thinking about that is to sort of as a simple metric is to look at the aggregate like active share. Okay. And so, um, so that one declined a lot over the last like 40 years. And you can sort of ask the question, like, did did this um, did the decline in active share come about because institutions changed their investment strategies, or did capital move from more active institutions to more passive institutions? And we find that at least if you look at the last like 10, 15 years, like 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 most of the decline in in the aggregate active share is because capital moved from like more active funds to more passive funds. The the contribution of like like institutions changing their own sort of like active share is is, is pretty modest. Hmm. And so now you can ask the question like, okay, suppose we would undo that. So suppose you would sort of like, like use these kinds of frameworks once you've estimated them to ask the question like, okay, what happens if, if you move capital back to those institutions where it came from, let's say a decade ago. And what you find is that there's a, a non-trivial impact on valuations. And so, so some, some, some capital I don't know, or some stocks were held by active institutions. They experienced outflows. Those stock prices came down and, and, and vice versa. Now then sort of like a, a related question that often comes up is sort of like, well, what did it do to like, like things like price informativeness, market efficiency and, and things like that. And there we find like a very small effect. So there's a non-trivial effect on valuations, but there's a fairly small effect on, on price informativeness. So if you look at sort of like how well valuations forecast future uh, uh, profits of, of companies, that didn't change a whole lot. And and so so you can ask sort of like why that is the case. and. That result sort of kind of critically depends on like who lost capital and where did it go to. And so if the capital moves from like investors who are very good at sort of like forecasting future fundamentals, then markets would become more kind of more inefficient if you wish. And so 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 the link between valuations and future fundamentals would weaken. Instead, if what we find is that that the um, the correlation between flows uh, from one institution to another and sort of like like how informed these individual institutions are about future fundamentals is very weak. And so it's not the case that sort of like money systematically moved from like more informed or less informed institutions to, to the other type. Um, so it's more of a, a mixed result in the sense that impact on valuations, but in terms of the connection between valuations and future fundamentals, um, um, there's less of a connection there. That's making my brain hurt. How? how <laughs> How how can valuations be affected, but the connection between fundamentals and valuations be relatively unaffected? Right. So so the question is like, does it like suppose you have like two groups of investors where one group of investors has like like very good information about future fundamentals, and there's another group of investors um, who are more let's say sentiment driven, um, uh, and and so they are like the ones disconnecting like prices from from fundamentals, like the typical noise traders. 
Now, if the money moves from sort of like the noise traders to the informed investors or vice versa, then prices become more, more informed. If instead money moves from um, 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 sort of like more, kind of quote unquote, more randomly, so it's not sort of a strong pattern in terms of like, like systematically money moving from one group to the other, but just capital gets sort of like reallocated more from active institutions to more passive institutions, um, then there's sort of like not, cer not necessarily an impact on, um, also then, then there could be an impact on valuations that is not necessarily correlated with like their the ability for prices to forecast to forecast future fundamentals. Wow. Okay, that makes more sense. Uh, I, I want to come back to the, the, just the concept of demand system uh, asset pricing. So a, a lot of our listeners are familiar with asset pricing models like the CAPM or the Fama French five factor model. How how would you differentiate this the model that you develop in your paper uh, demand system approach to asset pricing to those models? Okay, great models. question. Yes, yes. So, so at a basic level, like all asset pricing models, um, start from like modeling demand of investors, um, setting demand equal to supply and outcome asset prices. So in the basic cap M, right? So like let's say investors have like mean variance preferences, you solve for optimal portfolio, supply equals demand and outcome prices. So in that sense, like demand system <clears throat> asset pricing is not a new theory per se. It mm -hmm. is just testing sort of like models along a new dimension. And so you could have like always gone to the data and sort of said like, well, what does the CAPM tell us in terms of like the optimal portfolio that investors should hold? Um, and what do they actually hold? And sort of like what demand system asset pricing does is to say, okay, let's bring in this additional sort of like information from holdings and see whether it lines up with what our theories like tell us. And so let's say that we go with the five factor model. Um, then what that would tell us is that um, um, investors sort of like, like tilt their portfolio based on those characteristics that are part of that model. Now, what we find is that uh, if you start looking at the holdings data, and we've, we've mostly looked at like 13F filing, so that's at the institutional level. So it would be like kind of Vanguard as a whole, not Vanguard small cap growth fund. Then there's two sort of like, like very surprising facts. Um, the first is that the median institution only holds like 70 stocks. And so there's like thousands of stocks you can trade, but the median wow. institution holds just like 70 of them. Hmm. And then you can say, well, that's fine. It's still a very diversified portfolio potentially. Uh, but the second thing that's sort of surprising is that uh, these portfolios are not particularly diversified. And if you regress portfolio holdings on those characteristics, you get a very low R squared. And so investors do a lot of things that um, that are not well explained by those by those characteristics. Now, then the other thing, which is kind of a challenge uh, if you start thinking about those theories, is that, okay, investors do like very different things. And then you would imagine if demand is very elastic, if characteristics change, so suppose uh, profitability of a firm changes or like asset growth changes, then you would imagine they start changing their portfolios around very aggressively. Um, that effect is also very muted. So think of it as like, like institutions deviate from the market uh, by a lot. And then those deviations are very stable over time. Even though prices move around, characteristics move around. And that is not something that you would expect if, if you're constantly sort of optimizing based on those, on those characteristics. And so sort of to go back to your question of like, how does it connect to kind of traditional models? Sort of the, the core idea is really not so much about sort of the models as, as much as like, we're gonna test the same models along a different dimension. And then the key outcome of that is that demand appears to be much more inelastic. Portfolios are much less responsive to the information that we thought they would be responsive to, like be it prices or, or, or characteristics. And then that of course leads you to think, well, what, is, what are then the right theories that sort of like would explain that? And what are the further implications of those theories? Hmm. What new information do we get from this approach to asset pricing? Ah, so I think there's, there's um, um, I would say like one, one piece of information and, 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 and sort of like new answers. So. So you can ask new questions. So let me start there and then I'll get to your question about what information you get. Um, so the new the new answers is that you can answer those kind of like quantity questions that we started with. Like suppose I would ask you in the five factor model, there's been a, a shift from active to passive or a growth in ESG funds or uh, more foreign investors. How did that affect like, I don't know, the model? It's, it's kind of like hard to sort of like, like, like work out those questions. Um, so here you can answer those questions. So that's, I think, one sort of like upside is that there's a lot of questions of evolving quantities and that's why it's useful to develop this. Now, what new information do you get? Is that you get a more um, 
think of it as like a more disaggregated like view of like like markets. Um, and that I think is the real upside of this of this approach is that normally we see like prices move around um, and we don't really know why. And so then we tell lots of stories as to why prices went up or down. Now, what do we do over here? If we kind of go back to the level of, of, of demand, and again, this is like implied by any asset pricing model. And so now that means that sort of any move in prices, you can trace it back to individual investors. So if GameStop goes up by I don't know, a, a factor of 10, then you can sort of trace back in that case, like how important are like retail investors, how important are various like institutional institutional investors. Now, what that allows you to do is that you can start to sort of think about sort of like, first of all, like why do why do prices move? Like which investors trade and how much do they affect prices? Secondly, sort of like you can start to think about sort of like, like I don't know, a lot of the questions that we normally think about in terms of like, let's say return predictability at a much more disaggregated level. And so, so to give you a concrete example, one of the things you that we normally do is we take characteristics and we forecast returns. Okay, that's like the vast, vast majority of like empirical asset pricing. What you can do over here is you can start to forecast demand and then add up demand across all the investors and sort of then sort of like set that equal to supply and outcome prices. And so instead of like directly forecasting prices, if like one group of investors does respond to a particular signal, let's say momentum, but other investors do not, and those investors hold different stocks, then it may be the case that momentum works for one subset of stocks, but not for others. Wow. And so it kind of like opens up like, like a whole new, I don't know, area of thinking about return predictability, like sort of like from the bottom up. And again, this is consistent with like all of your standard models. It's just that by sort of leveraging sort of the holdings data, you can start to do this bottom up, bottom up approach. That is fascinating. Yeah, it is. What what role or 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 do they still play a role? Uh, characteristics like uh, market equity, book equity, profitability, like the Fama French type characteristics. So they play a role, obviously. Um, um, they um, um, so 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 they explain like 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 a I don't know certain fraction of of of, of returns. Um, what we find though that if you if you if you start from holdings and and maybe the easiest way to think about it is that like your investors demand is like 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 is made up out of two components. One is that if my view of like future cash flows and things like that doesn't change, but I see prices move around, then how quickly do I trade out of a particular stock? So that part I'm going to refer to as like the price elastic component. And then there's some additional information that I may receive about sort of like the firm's future fundamentals, riskiness, and stuff like that. And that leads me leads me to trade. Now, that second part is to think of that as like the shock to, to my to my demand. In that part, sort of, if you sort of see how important characteristics are and you add it up to prices, it's really just like an around like like 10% of the variation, 10 to 20% of the variation in returns that you can explain with that. Wow. The residual part, the part of like that demand component that you cannot sort of explain with characteristics is driving most of the variation. And so that's about 80%. Now, the good news is that sort of, that, that sort of like tells us a little bit about sort of like, I don't know, what we don't know about uh, about returns, but this is a new way of kind of like, like disaggregating that information because normally if you would address returns in the cross section on changes in characteristics, you get a very low R squared, that's right, 10, 20%. That residual is then kind of like, I don't know, who knows what's going on. In this case, you can sort of ask sort of like, okay, how important are different investors to explain that residual variation? And then if you want to think about predictability and things like that, then it's really about predicting that residual component more so than the component related to um, to characteristics. Now that said, sort of if you go back to, uh, to Cameron's question about like what new information do you get out of this, is you could sort of like understand a little bit better also why certain factors or why certain characteristics, like what the pricing of certain characteristics changes. So for instance, if you think about like value not performing particularly well over the last decade or so, and maybe minus the last couple of months, um, then, then you could sort of ask like which investors sort of like change their demand for particular characteristics. So you could sort of imagine that sort of like um, um, there's a particular sort of like appetite for like, like growthy firms that that group of investors sort of changes over time. And that's ultimately why value underperforms. Now you can trace it back to different types of investors, and that may help you to understand sort of also going forward, like what um, what the performance may be of different factors. And so characteristics are not, I know, it's not a, obviously like we want to get rid of characteristics altogether, but there's a lot of in, lot, lot of movement in prices and a lot of like variation in demand that is not well captured by 
uh, characteristics. Do, do you know the answer to the question about about value, about which investors were responsible for value underperforming? No, no, that one we haven't we haven't done. Um, huh. uh, but it, but it's a very again sort of like the moment you have sort of like like the simplest way maybe to think about it is that like once you can sort of decompose the movement in any stock into like the demand of each and every investor, then you can always reaggregate it by like momentum, by value, and you can kind of go through all of your favorite uh-huh. sort of like anomalies or factors. And sort of understand like like how important are let's say retail investors for momentum? How important are like like foreign investors for carry trades? Stuff like that, um, um, or like particular countries for like carry trades and things like that. And so you can sort of really sort of like like get a new perspective on what drives markets. One giving you an interpretation, and two, I don't know for other things like like understanding riskiness, like expected returns, it gives you another another look at that. <laughs> How do you explain what latent demand is? Yeah, so that is a uh, so that's really that residual component that I was mentioning. So, so, so think of like I, I choose my portfolio. Part of my my portfolio choices, I, I see whether prices are high or, or low, given like everything else. That's my demand sensitive component. Then I get sort of like my demand my demand shift or my demand shock. That part is in part explained by characteristics. Doesn't explain that much variation. And then there's like this big residual component. Um, and that residual component, that is what we refer to as latent demand. If we if we sort of add it up across investors, then that explains about 80% of variation in, in returns. And so one of the things that you could have like like thought about or what could have been the case is that you open up the holdings data and it could have been the case that sure investors hold like 70 hold like 70 stocks. And sure like if you run like regressions of like um um, holdings on those characteristics, you get a low R squared. But if you then take those, those error terms and you add them up across investors, it doesn't amount to a whole lot and it just cancels out. What we find is that it doesn't cancel out and this is really the main driver of, of return variation. Now, in part, that's interesting because it tells us that there's a lot of things we don't yet understand. And a lot of like 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 return variation that we cannot connect to sort of like, like observable factors. Uh, and that's really like what we're what we're now interested in, you have to understand. How do you, you know how do you estimate it? How do you estimate latent demand? Oh, so so the way it works. So the the uh, the simple. I'm going to give you the simplest version first, and then I'm going to tell you like the obstacle why that simple version doesn't really work. But the simple intuition is going to be the following. So essentially, you run a regression of portfolio weights on prices, characteristics, and then the error term that's latent demand. Okay, now there's a problem with running that regression because if lots of investors like a particular stock that is not well captured by characteristics, let's say GameStop. So lots of retail investors like GameStop. Well, their latent demand is gonna impact prices. And so if latent demand is very high, it's gonna push up prices. Well, now you have a correlation between prices and latent demand, so you can't really run that regression. And so the whole sort of like, like, like um, sort of challenge in estimating these demand models is to get that sort of like component that is sensitive to price, like right. So if prices move around, how much do I respond to that? And once you have that part, then latent demand is really just a residual from that from that model. Um, now, in terms of like economically, what you want to think about in terms of like latent demand, it's really like everything that we cannot observe with with characteristics. Because obviously, I know there's a lot out there. Like, in, let's say Netflix sort of like like I don't know changes number of subscribers or things like that. There's lots of information that we don't have in company set. Obviously, shifts investors' demand. All of that sort of ends up ends up in late. Mm. Um, like sentiment trading, like think GameStop again is a good example, perhaps of that. Um, so so yeah, so that's sort of like how we how we estimated and how to think about sort of like what is the what could be driving that. Man, so many questions. Um... Empirically, how has the price impact from institutions changed over time? Uh, so our estimates imply that um, the price impact has gone down. So markets have become more elastic over time. Wow. Uh, and that's kind of consistent with lots of uh, with, with, I don't know, with other other estimates that people have people have provided. Um, and so you see sort of like, like the elasticity sort of like has two features. One is that it's um, the elasticity is going up. So price impact is going is going down. The second thing that you see quite strongly in the data is that the um, uh, price impact goes up in in recessions. So in bad times, sort of like demand becomes more inelastic and price impact goes goes up. Why why do you think markets would have become more elastic over time? 
Um, it could be related to lots of things. One could be like simply sort of like trading technology may have may have improved. It may be easier to collect information. Like and people may have become more like investors may have become more agile to respond to um, uh, to information, ag aggregated information, and, and may respond sort of a bit more more aggressively. Now that's not to say that like like elasticity are still like very very low. Like just mm -hmm. orders of magnitude. Like the the thing that's kind of striking maybe just orders of magnitude. Like like normally what we in standard models price impact, if you trade 1% of a stock, then the price impact would be one over like 5,000. So essentially that means that that if you buy 10% of a stock, um, prices would move by, by essentially nothing. Okay, now few of us would probably think that if you buy 10% of a stock, prices wouldn't move at all, but that's really what the standard model uh, implies. And um, what the empirical literature tells you is that so the price impact is order of mag single stock is order of magnitude one. So you buy 1% of a stock, you move prices by by one percent, um, and that estimate is, is actually, and there's a surprising agreement actually among studies uh, using different data, different countries, different methods. Um, so the wedge between sort of like theory and and and, and empirics is, is like 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 a factor of like five thousand. So it's, it's kind of massive. Uh, wow. Um, is is it households or institutions that explain more of the variance in stock market volatility? Ah, okay, so so we looked at this in 2008. Um, and in particular, in the context of like, there was some debate about sort of like, are large asset managers sy systemic or not? Um, and so I'm going to make an, un I'm going to make a distinction in what I'm saying between large and, and smaller institutions. Um, so so suppose you do the, the following exercise in, in 2008. So you take the top 30 institutions, they manage around $6 trillion. Now take all other institutions, they also manage around $6 trillion. And take households, they also manage six trillion. So now I have like three groups of like exactly sort of the same of the same size. And I'm gonna ask sort of like like using our calculation, sort of like how much did each group sort of like contribute to like the cross-sectional variation in return? So not the whole market downturn, but just sort of like in the in the cross-section. And then you find that sort of like large institutions contribute very little. So they just like 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 approximately like around 10% of the variation in returns is due to the, the large institutions. Then there's a larger fraction that's coming from smaller institutions and a particularly large fraction during that period was was coming from households and so it's kind of like 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 so the upside down of like what people have thought about in terms of like the large institutions are the ones that are causing like a lot of the price movements the reason we don't get that and it's it's kind of a very um uh, direct fact in the data is that large institutions if you look at their portfolios they're fairly close to holding the market portfolio and if anything, they overweigh the largest and the most liquid stocks. So that means that if they experience like in or out flows, they kind of scale down all the assets kind of in proportion to their market cap. It doesn't have much of a cross-sectional impact. Small institutions, um, they act like small institutions, but as a group, they're doing sort of the same thing. And as a result, they are gonna have a larger impact on prices and that's, that's even larger for, for households. And so the ranking we get is that like the large institutions have the smallest impact on prices, followed by smaller institutions, and then the households are the most um, uh, the most important one in moving prices during that period across across stocks. Do you know if that generalizes outside of that period? Like, do households tend to have a lot of impact on volatility or the variance in volatility? Yeah. So so we haven't we haven't done this for like each and each and every each and every period. The fact that like large institutions sort of like. Um, uh, Will have a small impact on prices. That, that's going to generalize just by the nature of their of, of, of the structure of their portfolios, um, because for them to have a large impact on prices, what you would need to see is that like the very large investors would have a large overweight on like certain sectors or certain stocks, and that's simply not what you see. Like one of the things, if you just like measure and do a simple calculation of like active share and link it to the size of the institution, then obviously active share declines very very uh, sharply with like like size of the institution, and as a result. Um, um, the price impact that they will have is going to be smaller. Any hunch on what the impact would be of gamification apps like Robinhood? Uh, no, no. So, so, so the big, so, so the big unknown uh, that we have in our data, uh, and that's just a, a data restriction, is that we have like pretty good data on institutions from like 13F filing, which fund holdings, and stuff like that. The 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 way we sort of like measure retail investors is kind of as the complement. So Apple issues like 100 shares, 70 are being held by institutions, 30 are being held by retail investors. Now, like what fraction is coming from like like Robinhood traders uh, is much harder to is much I harder see. to establish. Um, 
Now, um, so so we always sort of have to look at sort of like retail investors as a as as a group. We do have new work though, um, using sort of like high net worth individuals, uh, where we cover like uh, a little over two trillion dollars in assets. And we actually have their portfolios as well. And so that will allow us to answer some of these questions. Now, how much of those are, those are probably not your Robinhood group. Um, but sort of like, 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 I don't know, at least we can sort of like remove that group and get a more refined sort of measure of the, of the complement of that, I guess, in terms of like retail traders. So, but directly sort of knowing sort of like how important Robinhood was for GameStop and things like that is, um, with the data we have, at least, I think it's hard to tell. Can latent demand be used to predict differences? In the expected returns? Uh, yes, so so you can. So so what we did is, uh, and this is a joint work with with Moto Yogo. Um, so what we did is we measure sort of like latent demand for each and every institution. So that's sort of like the part in your like portfolio holdings uh, for a given stock that we cannot explain with prices and characteristics, right? So so it seems that like let's say think of it like this. So so according to the model, I should hold like. I know, 10% in, uh, in Apple, but they actually hold like 14%. So in that case, my latent demand is, is positive. Now, one sort of like salient feature in the data is that if an in investor likes a particular stock now, it tends to still like that stock next year. So latent demand is still sort of like high, but it tends to mean revert. And so what you can then do is you can sort of for each and every investor, you can forecast how quickly like latent demand like mean reverts. Um, again, add it up across all the investors. And that gives you sort of like how much demand is going to change for a particular stock in in the next quarter or in the next in the next year, and so so that's something that we did. And 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 if you if you form a strategy uh, based on that, then that generates alpha relative to like like standard factor models, like a I don't know, three factor model, five factor model. Intuitively, like like one big advantage that you have here, uh, and and that I think is is something that is very hard to get from. Other methods um, is that normally if you if you try to build a strategy with characteristics, then what you do is you sort of like link characteristics to like future returns using some I don't know, historical period of let's say ten years, twenty years, and so on. Now, what is the main advantage of using holdings data is that if the world changes, uh, holdings change right away, and if there's breaks in the data, you would notice it right away. So think COVID um, in the fourth quarter of two thousand and nineteen. Um, um, Carnival Cruises and Zoom were not particularly sort of like unique in terms of latent demand. Well, that changed a lot in the first quarter of 2020. Now, imagine you run your Fama Macbeth regressions using the last 10 years of data. You're not going to detect anything. So, so that's going to be very much your own judgment call without a whole lot of measurement to sort of see, okay, how am I going to predict returns going forward? Well, now what, what can you do with a demand-based sort of approach? So you can say like, well, the reason why sort of like Zoom went up so much and let's say Carnival like dropped so much is because of these particular groups of investors. What do we know about those groups of investors? Well, for some of them, like demand is like very persistent. For some of them, demand is like much more transitory and it mean reverts more quickly. And so it means that kind of on a stock by stock basis, by re-aggregating sort of those investors, you get sort of an estimate of expected return that is like stock specific based on who actually owns mm. that security. And sort of like, how does investors typically trade? So even if you get very radical changes, think about inflation. Like one of the big obstacles people are talking about is that you can't really use historical data to forecast the impact of inflation on strategies because, well, we haven't seen a whole lot of inflation. So what are you going to do? Now you can then, again, sort of like with a demand-based approach, you can start thinking about, well, who's driving sort of like prices in real yields, nominal yields, who drives like break-even inflation? And how does it sort of, what does it tell you about expected returns in bond markets going forward? Do we, do we have that data ex ante? Like you said, you can build a strategy that has an alpha with this, but is it is it tradable? Ah, uh, yeah, we lag it a lot actually. So 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 normally, so so thirteen F findings come um, come out forty five days after the end of the quarter, um, and we lag it by six by six months. And so our like the way I think about our results is very much kind of like as a as a proof of concept. Like, does could you potentially do something like this? Like this? In, in, in ongoing work, we're sort of like trying kind of to build on this sort of in a much more systematic way and kind of use like all the new tools that people have developed in, in big data machine learning to see can you use those methods to forecast to forecast future demand. Because if you think about it, like and if you, if you thought it was like big data with like a couple of hundred characteristics and, 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 and lots of stocks, 
Well, here you have like really big data because now for every stock, you have lots of investors and every investor mm -hmm. lots of different, has lots of different positions. And so now you can really start to think about the Amazon model where like, well, you bought like a head and a scarf. You live in Chicago. Maybe you also want like a glove, but you also want to buy gloves. Yeah. But in our case, well, you kind of traded out of Google and Amazon. Maybe you're not that big on tech anymore. You may also sell sort of your position in Microsoft. And so all the tools that people have developed sort of like in, 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 in machine learning, sort of like computer science, like those become directly relevant um now in, in asset pricing because we're truly back to the level of of, of demand not so much for I don't know, your your head and your scar but now for financial securities and so so to your point like can you use it in in in, in practice obviously we haven't I'm, we're not running this with like real money in terms of like better standard metrics of like like how do you and uh, is the data available in, in real time the answer is the answer is yes mm -hmm. um how much more can one get out of this approach? I think that's one of the things we're sort of like exploring now. Like what we did in the first paper where we kind of introduced the framework. Um, uh, one of the questions that we got a lot is like, okay, you can estimate all these things, but how do we know that this is actually, that there's any information in here, I guess, to Cameron's point, like maybe it's all just like like measurement error. And so one of the ways sort of like that we sort of went about this is say like, okay, if, if, if the system is sort of like, I don't know, works as we think it works, then you should be able to forecast demand and then should like translate it in, in return predictability. And so that part, at least sort of as a very first pass works. And now we're trying to scale that up uh, using more advanced like methods. Yeah. It, as a, as a trading strategy, is it, is it arbitrage? Like are you earning a risk premium or is it what, how would you explain that? Um, so that's a very, Difficult question, uh, and it goes back to like what drives latent demand, um, because most of the variation is coming from that like latent demand. So it could be the case that um, part of it is like 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 driven by like risk factors that people like like if you think about sort of like um, uh, my COVID example from before, then it seems very plausible that sort of like one reason why my demand shifted for Carnival Cruises and 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 for Zoom, like none of my characteristics have really changed at that point. And so, but of course, investors have information about sort of well, these cash flows are very much exposed, uh, and 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 those are not. People may disagree on that, and that's all fine. And so, so then it would be, I don't know, perhaps it's risk compensation. If you think about sort of like latent demand in the context of GameStop, um, I don't know there's risk in there too, but but it's probably more like sentiment driven and and things like that. And so, one of the the themes that we're go like one of the ideas we're sort of like working on now is to sort of like try to disentangle so like what drives like latent demand. What drives latent demand at different periods for different groups of investors, and so the one of the things that, for instance, you you can do with this is, uh, and that relates to this active passive uh, conversation we had uh, in the beginning, is you can take latent demand at the at the investor level, and you can sort of ask like how well does like like investor A's latent demand forecast future fundamentals, or does it forecast future returns, or maybe it mean reverse and it's just like sentiment. And so we, we're doing this now sort of at an investor by investor level, stock by stock, then you can re-aggregate that. And then you can sort of say like, well, one of the reasons why maybe value underperformed in the first couple of years, let's say the first couple of years of the last decade was because of like fundamentals and later on it was driven by sentiment, things like that. That's wow. crazy. You're that there's, yeah. Well, it's, I guess it's the, it's the 90% of price variation that you're, that you're digging into. There's just seems like there's so much information in here that, that we don't have right now. Right. But, it, but, it, but, but, I guess the, I don't know the part that excites us is that 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 because it's sort of at the investor level, you can really get at sort of like okay, those investors seem to be very good at sort of like forecasting future fundamentals. Those investors seem to be early on in let's say trading momentum, so their demand forecasts future prices. So other investors' demand. So it could be the case that maybe some hedge funds are very good at forecasting flows that are coming from pension funds in the future, and that's why sort of they trade in. While others kind of like drop out because like, I don't know, maybe they think that sort of like demand is going to go down or they got excited about some stock and then that sort of like mean reverted. And so so just because you can do this investor by investor, you get a whole wealth of new information in, in terms of trying to understand like why prices move. Can you then turn it into like predictability? How much of that actually is 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 risk is, is, is some risk? How much of it is, 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 I don't know. Like at the end of the day, like it, like, we very much think that that is related to risk in the sense that it's not pure arbitrage. That seems like none of the numbers that we have suggest any anything close to that. Um, huh. um, but it does give you like lots of new ways of looking at at markets. Yeah, hopefully, yeah, sounds like it. D do you know which types of investors are most influential in setting prices? 
Yeah, so, so so that's right. So so one of the things that that we've looked at is sort of like um, suppose that uh, investors would get like in or out flows, like how much sort of would different types of investors um, uh, move prices? And what we find there is that the most sort of like impactful group uh, per dollar of assets that they manage is um, our hedge funds and, and small active uh, investment advisors. And so the intuition being is that that's kind of a combination of, of two things. Uh, one is, uh, if you look at their active share, like how much they deviate from uh, the market, um, that is kind of a measure of how much they disagree with kind of consensus, if you want. Like think of the market as consensus, their demand is very different from consensus. And so if they experience outflows and someone else has to hold those stocks that they weren't really willing to hold before. Now, the second thing that happens is that uh, if you look at the elasticity of different investors, then hedge funds are very price elastic. And so if they see like something that looks out of line with their with their demand, they're very agile to sort of move in. Other investors are less agile. And so now if you if you pull money away from hedge funds, then other investors have to hold it, but they're less responsive to price. And so prices have to move a lot more for other investors to, to step in. And so if you combine the two things together that their demand is very different from what other investors want to hold, Plus, to convince the other investors that they ha have to hold these other securities, prices have to move more. Their price impact per dollar that they manage is, is larger. Hmm. And then further to Ben's question, which type of investors are most influential in linking the firm characteristics to valuation ratios? Yeah, so that it, it, it depends on, on, on which characteristic you look at. But again, it's it's really the same, it's really the same types of same types of investors, simply because they move away the most from simply holding holding the market. Um, it is really the, the more the more active and the, the more price elastic ones that have like the largest impact because it's just you're pushing sort of like securities with like certain characteristics or because of particular like latent demand. You push those securities onto the other investors prices will have to move more to convince them to do so. Yeah. You change the connection between prices and, 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 and fundamentals. Yeah. Hmm. What what would happen if those most influential investors did switch to market cap indexing? Um so well it mostly like yeah so so it mostly would lead to and it's gonna do two things. One is that uh, obviously there's gonna be like repricing of 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 of, of, of securities. The second thing is it would make the market more inelastic. And so so because as, essentially like the elasticity of the whole market is a valuated average of the elasticity of each and every investor. And so if money moves away from the very elastic investors, um, then whoever is like left in the market is going to be less elastic. And any flow or any demand stroke that's going to happen is going to have a larger impact on, on prices. And so that's also where the whole debate about sort of like active versus passive is is, is, is kind of like a, a hard one to settle in the sense that like if you want to sort of know whether like like the, the growth in passive has made the market more elastic or or not, it really depends on like where the money came from. Like if the money came from very sleepy buy and hold households who rebalance their 401k one once every seven years, now maybe it made the market actually more elastic if they if they hold certain like like wow. strategies versus if they if it came from very agile hedge funds, it's a different story. And how influential is a huge firm like Vanguard in setting prices? Well, um, if they just hold the market, let's sort of like for, for argument's sake, so say that they're and the direct share is very low. So let's say that they're close to holding the market. They're not that influential in setting sort of the, the, the cross section of, of prices, um, but they do lower the elasticity of the market as a whole. And so it goes back to this argument where like the overall elasticity of the market is the, is the evaluated average across all the investors. Now, if you're a pure index fund, the elasticity that you provide to the market is zero. Because if like if, if, if GameStop goes up like by a factor of 10, you just sort of like hold on to it. If you're pure market in market in market weighted investor. And so as a result, sort of like 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 if you move money from the active to passive funds, um, um, like the, or or to like the bank, like it's going to sort of like 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 make things potentially more uh, more inelastic. Um, but that in terms of like how much their own sort of like flows are going to move, like like the cross section of prices, the answer is going to be very little. Uh, and that goes back to the to this the conversation we had, like for instance, in two thousand eight, they just scaled down all stocks in proportion to to the market cap, and that's going to have like a pretty even effect on prices. 
Is there a relationship between elasticity and market efficiency? Um, I don't think we know. So uh, that's the honest answer. So, so, so the way I think about sort of like um, the whole conversation about sort of like like market efficiency and excess volatility and why do prices prices move move so much and um, it's kind of a combination of like two things. Uh, one is um, like like flows in and out of the market and demand of different investors. Then how those flows get amplified in the market. And so inelastic markets only tells you something about the second part. So it only tells you that like a given shock gets amplified much more than what it would be in 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 even in a very elastic financial market. It doesn't tell you like whether the flow or the demand of different investors, whether that one was like like informed and tell you something about future fundamentals, or whether there was like sentiment driven and and potentially moving prices away from fundamentals. And so 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 our sort of next paper is going to be all about sort of like what drives the flows, what are what is late demand, what are the shocks? Because I think your question is a very important one and I and and the one that we also want to answer. Hmm. Um, but unfortunately we only have like half we have half of the answer we think uh, at least sort of like that's sort of what our um, current agenda suggests sort of like markets are more inelastic than what we which we typically thought. That means lots of shocks get amplified much more than before. What it doesn't tell you yet is that um, the shocks that are hitting markets are more or less informed. So that's really like where we are going next. Very interesting. Uh, okay, we talked about Vanguard and their influence on prices uh, b based on that. So maybe I'll just reiterate what I think you said. Um, assume Vanguard is just cap weighted for the sake of argument. They're not affecting prices necessarily but they're making the market less elastic is that right yeah so if you like someone who holds like purely the market um if you would go from a situation where let's say you have like like a bunch of like fairly agile investors um and you move to a situation where that money goes to um a, a cap weighted investor then you would lower the elasticity of the market but not necessarily affect prices or, or would there still be a price effect well, it depends on what the old investor did. So if the old investor, right. like, so, so like, like if the old investor <clears throat> so was overweighting like stock A and underweighting stock B, then of course there's going to be like price effects on, on that. Now, if you think about sort of like the new money, so sort of, like, like moving into, moving into to Vanguard and they're becoming the largest share and otherwise it would have gone to other stocks. Again, that would have an impact on, on prices. Um, but in terms of like, if you take again like the example of 2008 or I think other times of stress where you see like large flows out of like certain types of institutions, um, like like how much do you affect the cross section of prices? Um, the answer is not so much because you just scale down everything sort of like roughly in proportion. And so you get a very sort of equal demand shock across different uh, across different securities. Now, where things would get very different is that suppose that Vanguard would introduce like a, a technology fund that becomes like very, very, very large. Again, of course, it's a whole different scenario because now suddenly sort of like you can get shocks across different sectors. Okay, so based on that, we, we often hear this idea or get questions about the idea that index funds are distorting market prices as they continue to grow in magnitude. Is there any val validity to that or a reason it would be true? So it's 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 not, yeah, so it's, it's not very obvious to me. Like in the sense of like, like, um, um, in terms of like an impact on elasticity, um, um, I think there um, there are some evidence that 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 they may have. Um, in terms of like directly distorting prices and making markets like less efficient or something like that, um, from what I know, I think there's there's at least from our calculations, that's not something that we that we see. If you look at sort of like like going back to what we talked about before, if you look at sort of like like where the money came from um, that went to passive investors. And see whether it came from investors who are systematically more or less informed about future fundamentals. Uh, that correlation is like essentially zero. And so <laughs> it's not that systematically like it, it. It went sort of like similarly from like like informed and uninformed investors to more passive institutions. And so so given the absence of that of that correlation, um, at this point, I don't think there's much evidence to that I'm aware of at least. Sort of like maybe there's other evidence I don't know, but based on on that calculation, uh, it's, it's not that obvious to me. Okay, uh, I've got one more question on the just the gr growth of indexing concept. If if the growth of cap weighted index funds makes markets less elastic, w what is the implication of that for investors? 
Yeah, so the, the implication could be that that if you get large shocks to markets, if you get larger flows um, to markets, um, is that it could have an outsized impact on prices. And so so the same size shock is going to have a larger impact on, on, on prices. Um, but the interesting thing, like, let me just sort of give you like, like one other example, which is kind of interesting in this context of inelastic markets. Um, so uh, there's a recent paper by uh, Jonathan Parker, Antoinette Shore and, and co-authors, uh, where they look at the sort of the growth of target date funds. Now, target date funds, they add like a very, very small amount of elasticity to the market because like, like I don't know, let's say there are 60, 40 stocks and bonds. Um, and so if the market rallies, they sell a little bit of equity. And so if prices go up, they lean a little bit against that. But it's very, very minimal. Um, and what they sort of like like show uh, or what their results suggest is that um, that the growth of targeted funds made markets more elastic. And so, so what that means is that the market was even more inelastic before if those like very inelastic investors make the market more elastic. And so that's why it's very sort of like tricky to sort of start, I know it's not tricky, but like one has to be careful in sort of making statements about, uh, let's say targeted funds make markets more inelastic because well, if what households were doing before is to lock up their money, be buying old and do absolutely nothing. Well, actually wow. maybe they made markets more elastic. Uh, yeah. And so, so, so I think the proper accounting is to sort of see, okay, where does the money come from? What was their elasticity? Where does it go to? But of course, if everything happens in that space of like very inelastic investor, the bottom line is that the whole market is is, is quite inelastic. Amazing. Do we know which individual firm is most influential in setting prices? Oh, uh, we could compute it. We didn't do it, but like like per dollar of AUM, like who would have the largest impact? We didn't we didn't do that. No, we could, but we haven't done that. Wow. Um, but yeah, it goes back to the point, like, I don't know, give, once you have everything at the stock investor level, lots of calculations one can do uh, to sort of answer questions like that, yeah. Cool. What, what does demand system pricing tell us about the effect of socially responsible investing on, on, on prices? Oh, okay. Um, so there's a couple of like ways to approach that, I think. Um, First, let's sort of think about sort of like what additional information it can provide. Um, so there's a lot of debate about sort of like, um, for instance, different like like ESG scores that are out there that are not very highly correlated. Uh, we don't really know like which which scores like investors pay attention to. Now that that question you can answer with demand system asset pricing because what you could do is to say like, well, there's different scores. There's scores from like like the MSCI, Sustain Analytics, and so on, and you can sort of see like which like scores like correlate with demand of different investors. Um, and so now you could sort of say like okay, like like this fraction of like total market cap is attending to those scores, and this fraction is attending to other scores. And so so that part you can you can easily do. Um, you can then also see sort of like how much sort of like that appetite for particular stocks uh, for particular scores has changed over time. And then you could use a model to sort of like sort out sort of like how much sort of the um, um, how much the growth in sort of like uh, attention to like green green stocks, how much it affected affected valuations. Um, uh, but that's sort of like is is sort of like I don't know, it's something that conceptually um, can be done with like once you have like multiple scores and sort of like figure that out. Um, what the model would suggest, or what the framework would suggest, is that that the impact on valuations would be, uh, yeah, would not be zero. So if you have an extremely elastic market, right, then what would happen is that someone like really likes green stocks, you would sort of give a lot of like the green stocks. If you don't care about sort of like green stocks at all, you would give your green stocks very happily to that green investor, and and, and there's a very modest impact on on, on prices. Um, now that has a sort of like a, 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 a important flip side is that you would sort of see like very large flows in financial markets. Yeah, but that's typically not something that you that you see. And so if, if, if flows are modest and demand shifts a lot, then it has to go in prices. Uh, and so so in terms of like, do we know like how much of like like movements in prices is because of like additional demand for ESG and things like that? That's not something that um, that we know at this point. Uh, but conceptually, you can easily you can easily do that. Hmm. What effect would we expect on U.S. asset prices if a change in the U.S. dollar's reserve status affected foreign demand for US assets. Ah, okay, great. So right, so 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 in a, in in sort of like a separate uh, like an, another paper we've done with, with Modo Yogo, we look at sort of like a, a model of demand, uh, but of the whole world. And so we sort of think about sort of like think of it as a country now as an investor. 
and you choose between like short term bonds, long term bonds and equities across like all countries, like sort of like all over all over the world. Now, one fact that's very striking is that suppose that um, you look at UK investors and you sort of ask like, well, what is your demand for different countries? Given their characteristics, given their valuations, how much do you invest in German equities? How much do you invest in Italian government bonds and, and, and things like that? Now, estimated model for the whole world minus the US. And now predict what do investors want to hold of US assets? Okay, so you get some prediction and you look at the actual holdings and there's a massive gap. And so foreign investors have this very strong sort of like outsized demand for, for US assets. And so, so what that means is that suppose that for, I don't know, for whatever reason, sort of like that sort of like, like, like special demand uh, for US assets wouldn't be there anymore because I don't know, maybe investors get concerned about like certain aspects of risk and things like that. Um, then you can compute the impact on prices. And so like one of the things you would, you would see is that there would, that the demand for US uh, government bonds would go down a lot. And in terms of order of magnitude, the impact on prices uh, would be between like one and a half and two percent in terms of in terms of yields. So 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 treasury yields would jump up by one and a half to to two percent. And there's actually a, a couple of like recent papers that um, that find a similar order of magnitude coming from the demand mm -hmm. of, of like of like foreign investors. Now that one is, is relevant for a bunch of questions that we're thinking about now, right? So imagine like. Um, uh, the, if you if you're interested in sort of like the impact of like demand for government bonds uh, and 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 broader implications, sort of think about the fragmentation tool that the ECB is now considering. It's really asking a question, but sort of like how much of Italian government debt would the ECB have to buy to keep keep yield spreads below below a certain level? Or questions about like fiscal capacity: how much government debt can the U.S. issue before yields really start to rise? And so those questions you all kind of like want to consider in a global context, because if you don't want to buy U.S. bonds, you want to buy, I don't know, that capital is going to go somewhere else. Or if people or investors get worried about Europe, then it's going to have a spillover mm -hmm. effect on, on U.S. demand. And so, so what we've estimated, at least sort of um, um, during the last like, like, like 15 years, is that there's a very strong demand for U.S. assets has a large impact on, on valuations. Um, but you also can use that kind of a framework to start thinking about uh, to what extent that and a privilege that the U.S. sort of experienced uh, is, is, is still going to be there in the future. Hmm. It's crazy stuff. Uh, okay, I want to move to your <clears throat> your your recent working or more recent working paper on inelastic markets. Uh, we we've touched on inelastic markets. There may be some overlap in these next questions, but I think for our listeners, a lot of this a lot of this has been new information, um, and it was it was for us too. So I. I think the overlap is actually okay uh, in this case. Uh, all right, so you, you already touched on this question, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna go again. Um, can, can you re-explain what it means for the market to be inelastic? Yeah, uh, yes. Le and let me sort of also like, like sort of like clarify perhaps a little bit what the distinction is between sort of like what we've just talked about and, um, and the work with Xavier Gebex uh, from Harvard uh, on the inelastic markets hypothesis. So, so, um, the, the the first work we talked about with, with like Moto Yogo and, and Rob Richmond um, is is on the cross section of U.S. equities largely, and so um, what we work on in the paper with uh, with Xavier is on the aggregate stock market, and so it's really motivated by you see these like very large swings in prices, and we have very little sort of understanding like with lots of theories like why why prices move up and down. But there's like one feature that like rational and behavioral models have in common if it comes to the ag and stock market is that markets are very elastic. Now, order of magnitude is, is kind of striking. So so the, the elasticity that you get uh, out of standard like theory is like order of magnitude, like uh, like 10 or 20. Okay, And so that means that if you buy 20% um, uh, of the stock market, prices would move by just 1%. So if the Norwegian sovereign wealth fund would sell 10% of 10% uh, of the holdings that they have, uh, it would be just like a blip in the market. You wouldn't you wouldn't notice it. Like before lunch, it would be gone. Uh, that seems like kind of to us like that seems like quite striking. And so um, so we sort of explore the idea that well maybe markets are actually uh, quite inelastic, meaning that small effects on um, small flows into the market or the demand shocks can have a larger effect. Okay, now. Why sort of like did we get here sort of like for the aggregate stock market? And there's sort of like two ways of of uh, of getting at this. So one is that you can sort of ask, well, who owns the market, and who can make this market so elastic? So suppose in March of 2020, so like stock markets fall down like 30 percent, like who are those agile investors that rush in to buy the market then, if you think that the market's mispriced? Um, and so 
So what we what we sort of do is we kind of first go like investor group by investor group. So you look at major funds, there's kind of three groups of major funds. You have pure equity funds, uh, you have some targeted funds, 60, 40, 70, 30 funds. Um, and then you have like like bond funds, and there's a very small sort of like group of like like balanced funds who can be a bit more agile. But even there, not a whole lot of movement. So think of it as like it's either fully equities or it's a balanced fund. But those can provide very little elasticity. If you're like an all equity fund and the market like goes up or down, you can buy individual securities, but the market as a whole, you can't really do anything about. Next one, ETFs, even more extreme. It's pretty much all equities or just, just, just bonds. Now go to pension funds. Well, what they do is they have their target allocation of let's say 60, 40. If markets fall, then they gradually sort of trade back, trade back to target. And, and so, so then you kind of like keep going and keep going. And then at the end of the day, there's not a whole lot, not a whole lot of capital left that is also agile. And so we then ran a survey uh, among sort of like academics and, 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 uh, and, and, and industry experts. And so sort we of asked like, okay, suppose that there's a $1 billion sort of inflow into the market. How much does it move prices where, I don't know, before the release of our paper, the, the overwhelming response was zero. We're gradually moving up to some response. Um, but then we also asked sort of like, okay, what is the mechanism? So, so who is, who's providing this elasticity? And then the answer was like, it's either hedge funds or broker dealers. And the good thing is those, I think we can rule out uh, in the sense that if you look at what happens to hedge funds during downturns, I think 2008, well, hedge funds experience like outflows themselves or like risk constraints are binding. And so they're not the ones that sort of like, like come in very aggressively. If you look at broker dealers, uh, they're just like they're just really really small. So broker dealers just own like uh, like like one percent of the market, less than that. And so if you get a pretty large inflow into the market, um, they wouldn't be able to sort of like absorb that. And so kind of the mental picture that 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 emerges from that is that there's lots of investors who hold like either fully equity or some fixed share allocation, and there's very few investors that can actually very aggressively time the market. And so with that in mind, sort of like, like, like if you sort of like kind of add all of that up, then you get to a situation where markets are, uh, are potentially quite inelastic. So why is understanding market elasticity important? Uh, because we want to understand why, why, why are markets so volatile? So, so, so we just see on, on, on days without much news that stock prices can move by like, I don't know, one, two percent. We see that. During COVID, stock prices fall thirty percent. Of course, there's fundamental reasons. It's not that there's you know, sometimes there's, there's news, but like the, the amount of volatility in markets is is much higher than the volatility in fundamentals. And so, one of the things that people have thought about for a long time, uh, going back to Schiller's uh, sort of like seminal work, is say, okay, why are prices so much more volatile than than fundamentals? And 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 to us, sort of like a sort of like I don't know, there's two parts to that question. One is like, okay, what drives sort of like those flows into markets? And second, how do those flows get amplified? And and so so what we're suggesting is that like much smaller flows into markets can have a much larger effect. Next question is like okay, then what drives those flows into markets? And then you can get into questions about sort of like kind of do I say you think that that's like rational or not or things like that, uh, depending on like maybe which group it comes from during what episodes it happens and 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 things like that. So ultimately, I think sort of it's really just to understand like why I know why markets move, why are markets so volatile, and how to interpret market movements. I, I just want to come back to make sure something something is clear for me and, and for people listening. Uh, before, when we were talking about asset demand systems, we were talking, and we were talking about inelasticity in that respect, we were talking more about cross-sectional inelasticity, and now we're talking about the fluctuations in the whole entire market. That's right. And so, the, yeah, yeah, you, that's a great question. So, uh, great observation. So, we refer in a paper Xavier, we refer to like like the former as the micro elasticity. It's like Apple versus Google. Um, and then at the stock market level, it's the macro elasticity. Now, also in the theories, there's a big distinction between that because in in like why is the elasticity so high in the first place uh, at the individual stock level, like the 5,000 I mentioned before, is because app, like if you think about the standard cap M, all that matters is your stock's beta and a little bit of idiosyncratic risk, which kind of diversifies away. And so Apple and Google are like very close substitutes. All you have to tell me is like the beta and some idiosyncratic risk and off you go. Um, at the level of the aggregate stock market, um, like the, the, the substitute would be, let's say bonds or maybe some corporate bonds. Those are less similar 
than Apple and Google. Hmm. And so, so the idea is that so the more similar two securities are, the higher the cross elasticity between the two. So the extreme example would be take a 10-year government bond and a nine-year government bond with like 11 months to maturity. Well, those are like essentially the same maturity. If, if I would tell you that like it would be like really big like price fluctuations, you would say like, well, that 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 is too good a deal and and it would be like massive arbitrage there. Now the arbitrage between stocks and bonds is a lot less obvious uh, because you can see big swings in, in in bond yields, you can see big swings in in, in stock markets um, that can last for like long periods of time, and so so that like like the closer the substitutes are, the higher the elasticity, uh, and that's sort of like why in all of the I don't know, CAPM and so on. So the elasticity of individual securities is like five thousand. The elasticity of the market as a whole is like is like twenty. Um, and then empirically, both of those are like a lot lower. Um, but you're absolutely right to point out the difference between the two types of elasticities, which is very important. Okay, I'm, I'm glad I asked then. Uh, on market elasticity, how do you estimate it? Ah, okay. So, so that one's um, uh, is a bit more involved. Uh, so, in general, the way how you estimate elasticity is, is the following. Uh, so, I'm going to start with the micro elasticity, and then I'm going to go to the macro elasticity because I think the micro elasticity is easier to uh, to explain. So, the way it works is in general, and this is just um, uh, the only way to estimate these things is that there's a demand shock to one group of investors. Um, and that one's going to move prices. And so let's take uh, the traditional example is like index inclusion. So let's, as a thought experiment, so like one stock gets randomly added to the index. Okay, there's a group of like index investors who now have to buy that security. Oh. Okay, so you get a, a, a demand shock from the index investors. Now someone else has to give up their shares. And so now we can measure like, okay, there's like 5% demand for that particular security um, from index investors. How much do prices need to go up for other investors to give up their shares? Okay, and so that's the way we normally estimate the elasticity of the investors who are giving up their shares. Okay, and so that's sort of like the the, the general recipe. And so the only thing that differs, sort of like across like different studies, is what shock you use to what group of of investors. And so you can sort of think about sort of the index inclusion being one of them. Um, there's a there's a paper that looks at sort of like changes in Morningstar ratings, and so then you see like like big shifts in flows, and that sort of like changes prices. And um, there's people who've looked at sort of like like dividend payments uh, of uh, uh, of firms, and then you can use those as sort of ways of moving prices around. And so what we've done in the in the paper with like Xavier is that we have like a separate sort of like methodology uh, that we developed in a separate paper, where essentially the idea is that you're isolating sort of like like demand shocks idiosyncratic demand shocks to like different groups of, of investors. So you see like you get a like a shock to the demand coming from like retail investors, like like the uh, the GameStop example we had before, or you get a demand shock to like 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 mutual fund investors or things like that. And then you can use that uh, to sort of see like okay if like one group of investors suddenly um, uh, wants to hold more of the stock market, how much do prices need to move for all the other investors to give up some of their shares? Mm -hmm. to accommodate that demand shock of these of these other investors and so that's sort of in the background sort of like what the uh, what the methodology is uh, in terms of like estimating those estimating those elasticities now there's another uh, approach which is sort of more at a more bottom up uh, if, you, if you wish um, where um, which is more of a calibration than like a direct estimation but I think it goes a long way to understand what's going on is that you can sort of like add up sort of like group by group as I mentioned before, um, like 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 what fraction of holdings is in like like either like all equity funds or like in balanced funds, and the reason is that for an all equity fund the elasticity is zero. If you have like a let's say a sixty forty fund, uh, then the elasticity is one minus the fraction they invest in in equities. Okay, and so if you have let's say a fund that invests eighty percent in stocks, twenty percent in bonds, the elasticity is zero point two. That would give you a price impact or a multiplier of one over zero point two, which is which is fine. What that means is that you buy one percent of the market, prices go up by five percent. And so you can also start like going sort of like group by group uh, and sort of measure um, like like what what fraction of capital is sort of elastic, and you kind of get a you get a sense of like a, like a very large fraction is is not very responsive to prices. What are the limitations to these approaches? Well, the limitations are um, that you're trying to isolate sort of like a shift in demand to one group of investors alone. 
And so the main sort of like threat to sort of like not measuring elasticities correctly is that you don't isolate a shock to just that one group of investors, but it's in fact correlated with the demand still of the other investors. Okay, and so suppose that I, I don't know, suppose I'm trading um, and the stock market, so I'm buying sort of like the market today and stock market goes up by 2%. Well, it's probably not because of like my, me buying my, buying the market, but lots of other investors who also sort of like whose demand also changed on that on that day. And so the main challenge is that if I sort of like, if I don't properly sort of isolate uh, a shift in demand for just that one group of investors, but instead it's actually, there's like a lot of like know, hidden demand, which is correlated with the demand of these other investors. Okay, then you're mismeasuring because there's actually the change in prices wasn't sort of like caused by just this like smaller group of demand, but it's actually much broader group of, of, of demand. And so that's sort of like where that this whole literature is about um, is about trying to sort of like isolate those events uh, and trace back sort of shifts in demand of different different investors. So that's like people have used index inclusion, dividend payments, like changes in like Morningstar ratings. There's like um, like regulations in Chile of like pension funds that 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 change. There's like IPO restrictions in, in, in China. There's like just lots and lots and lots of things. Uh, people are using stimulus checks now um, that mm -hmm. came to, to households and so on. The good news is that I think that um, so the big picture across like 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 10 plus papers that we cite in the in in, in the paper Zavi is that sort of the, the there is some range of elasticities, but there's a surprising amount of agreement in terms mm -hmm. of the elasticities at the stock level are right around one. And elasticities at the level of like factors in the aggregate stock market appear to be appear to be below one. Okay. Um, that said, like this is a new app. This is a whole new literature, and 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 I'm sure we're gonna learn stuff over time. And to be cautious, the reason why we call our paper the inelastic markets hypothesis was to sort of like say, like, okay, this seems like a like plausible to us. Uh, here's like the first estimate that we put on the table. Um, um, that seems like much lower than what you would have expected. Um, and we think it's important to measure this, um, but we're very open to other methodologies, new approaches to sort of like measure this. Um, but sort of like the papers that have come out sort of like after us, uh, they find sort of like similar, similar analysis, but I'm sure as everything in economics, this is not the last word I'm, I'm, I'm sure. So we, we had, uh, Gene Fahm on our podcast a while ago and we asked him about about your work, and he, he he laughed and said, "Oh, his office is right down the hall from mine." But then he, he said, "Well, it's still it's still just a hypothesis." Ba basically, what uh basically what you just said. No, no, and, and that that is right. I think sort of like a let's put it like this. I think sort of at a single stock level, um, like there, there's like I know people have been trying to estimate that since the mid mid '80s. There's a lot more evidence on that, and um, the gap between sort of analysis of like five thousand. Uh, that theories imply, and the analysis mm -hmm. of like I know one that people estimate uh, is 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 the first thing. Now the second thing is that, um, mm -hmm. as we talked about before, the macro elasticity is below the micro elasticity, right? Because stocks and bonds are less close substitutes than Apple and Google, right? And so, given that we have a lot of it, I know, a lot more experience estimating micro elasticities, and that's an upper bound on the macro elasticity. Mm. Well, if the micro elasticity is right around one, then you would expect the macro elasticity to be kind of one or lower. And so, so sort of like by that logic, it's sort of like, um, I think it's sort of, uh, uh, there's a lot of like papers at the same time that sort of like, like different countries, different sample periods, different methodologies that also sort of like land at an elasticity that's like, like fairly low. Um, there needs to be something very systematically sort of like that where, that all of these studies miss, which, I yeah, know. yeah, yeah. It's, it's a possibility, Super interesting. Um, but that's sort of like where um, where this comes from, and and I guess with efficient markets, people are still going on about about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's true. <laughs> so I think Gina's, that is also uh, true. That's still uh, a hypothesis. So, yeah, and again, too. like yeah, so we're very, I know, very open to like alternative methods measurement and so on. So it's, I think it's a very, I mean, to us, it's an important question. Like we've talked in the beginning about like what the upside is if we can if we can measure this sort of accurately for for lots of applications, and so. We think that at the very least, sort of like we should have like theories and models that explain like holdings data alongside like prices and 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 and, and characteristics and macro variables. Um, and so, um, so yeah, that's I think that's where we're at at this at this point. You mentioned a couple times that the macro elastic, elasticity is below the micro elasticity. Do you have any quantification of what the macro elasticity is? 
Yeah, so our estimates in, uh, are like um, um, like our I don't know, preferred estimates right around sort of like zero point two. Um, so that gives you a multiplier of like like five. So you buy one percent of the market, you move prices by five percent. No, there's like wow. uncertainty around those estimates. So you get some somewhere between like three and and eight. Um, uh, in terms of like the 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 range of estimates that we uh, that we get at the individual stock level, it's around one. So you buy one percent of like an apple, it price go up by go up by one percent. Um, so so that's sort of the order of magnitude that you that you get. Now, if again, if you if you think about the idea that targeted funds, like let's just sort of like to make it concrete, if you think that targeted funds made the market more elastic. Uh, and so that means that the elasticity of targeted funds are below what it was at the market level before that. Now, the typical targeted fund has like, let's say, 60% in equities, 70% in equities. And so that already gives you like an elasticity of like one minus that. Um, so yep. 0.3, 0.4 in for that. And you're right around there. And so so it's a, it's almost like an undergraduate example where you say like, okay, you have two funds, like one is a bond fund, one is a balanced fund. You move $1 from your, balance, from your bond fund to the balance fund, how much do, do prices move? And you suddenly get like, these very large multipliers, um, but then you realize that the market, like I know, it seems a lot like that. So, does inelasticity extend to common risk factors such as you know size and value? A uh, great question. Yes. So the answer is yes, and it really is sort of the the uh, the more aggregated you go, um, the lower the elasticity. So individual stock level very idiosyncratic. Um, you have the highest elasticity, which is still fairly low. If you then go to like larger stocks, still in the cross section, elasticity fall. So the elasticity of Apple and Tesla is much lower than of like some very small biotech firm. And the reason is that they sort of like are important, like they get a large weight in many like cap weighted indices. And so you kind of have to hold it. You can't sort of deviate all that much from those large stocks. And so the demand for those securities is more, more inelastic. So, so now you go from like small cap to large cap. Now, if you go to the level of like factors, size and value, there's a, a very nice paper by Jay Lee who's trying to estimate it for size and value factors. Um, and they get also elasticities or, or multipliers, I should say, uh, also like between two and five. Hmm. Um, and so, so so you're right that sort of like like this this logic applies to like essentially like all markets, not just uh, equity markets, also bond markets. But the elasticity sort of like vary and, and sort of the, I don't know, conceptually what you want to think about is like, like what close substitutes do you have do you have available? So if you think about treasuries, then maybe safe corporate bonds are fairly close substitutes. Um, and so that sort of like gives you some more some more elasticity there. Okay, now we're talking about flows at the like aggregate market level. Um, how, how can there be flows into stocks, for example, when for every buyer there's a seller? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this took us a while. So this one is a... Uh, is, uh, yeah, it's, it's surprisingly um, tricky to be honest. So, 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 if you think about it for the first, so, so I'm going to tell you what the answer is. But so, 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 so the. Um, let me give you an example, and then I'll tell you sort of like how to properly sort of like measure this. So, so suppose like you go back to my earlier like undergrad example. We have like a, a bond fund, and you have a balance fund. Balance fund holds like eighty percent stocks and twenty percent bonds. Um, now suppose I move one dollar from my bond fund to the uh, to the balance fund. Then what you will get if you sort of do you you work out the, the, the calculations and you can see that like like prices go prices go up, but if you would sort of like think about what happened in terms of like equity flows, uh, there's no equity flows whatsoever. But clearly we would agree that like like money went into the stock market because they moved money from a bond fund to this balance fund. So how do you properly compute flows? So you cannot sort of like just add up sort of like 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 flows in just the stock market because then for every buyer there's a seller. And the way you um, you do it correctly is that you have to equity weight the flows into every institution. And so what it means is that the bond fund get an outflow of like $1. The balance fund gets an inflow of $1. Okay. Now the total flow across the two obviously is, is zero. But if I equity weight them, then I put 100% weight on the balance fund because it holds all of the equities. I put zero weight on the bond fund. And so the equity weighted flow is 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 one, and so and so what you can mm -hmm. show is that sort of like and this is uh, it's just I don't know you can it's accounting uh, so so it, this follows very directly from just market clearing that the way you should sort of aggregate individual investors 
And the way you should aggregate flows is using equity weights and not asset weights. Because if you do things using asset weights, then you you get into the for every buyer there's a there's a seller. And so, hmm. so the ideal measure that you want um, is is you take every investor, you look at all of their investments, and you measure the flow that they the new capital they allocate to all of the markets. Okay. And now you sort of like um, aggregate those flows across investors using the share of the equity market that each of them holds. And that's the flow into the stock market. And how long does the price impact of flows last? Yeah, so that's a, it's a very important question, but one that's even harder to answer. So, um, so what we focused on is on, um, on quarterly price impact. Um, and we go out up to like four quarters. But it's really hard to measure this in one quarter. If you go out to four quarters, then like so the the kind of confidence interval widens so much that there's not all that much you can say after after one year. Um, and so it all depends on how persistent or how transitory flows are. So if you get a permanent um, shift in, uh, in 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 flow, so let's say the Norwegian sovereign wealth fund decides to increase its allocation to equities from sixty to seventy percent. And it's going to stay there for the foreseeable future. Um, then, at least what our model implies is that prices are going to be permanently higher. Mm. Okay, and that's just kind of a this is kind of important like insight, I think, uh, because it also sort of like revisits all of the uh, the work we have on sort of like testing, let's say, market efficiency. Because normally the kind of event study graphs that we look at is that like prices, and the ideal graphs like prices are like flat, then they jump up and then they stay there. In our model, that doesn't tell you anything about market efficiency. Mm. If there's a completely uninformed flow that's going to stay there forever, it's going to shift demand forever. Prices are going to be permanently higher, and that's and that's it. So if let's say our example from before, Vanguard introduces a new fund um, in healthcare, it like it attracts a certain amount of like assets, it's going to permanently shift those prices. Expected returns going forward are going to be permanently lower. Now the impact on prices is of course much larger than on unexpected returns. And so you can get sort of like a big impact in, in, in prices, but a very small impact on expected returns. So it's very hard to detect empirically. And so that's why sort of empirically, it's very hard to make statements about sort of like, what is the impact of flows on unexpected returns uh, or on, 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 on price over like what horizon is just because of the, the, the noise that you get at longer horizons is just like very large. And that makes it very hard to get precise, precise estimates. Okay, hold on. You just you, you broke my brain for a second there. Um, how how can prices change, and expected returns don't? No no so so no no so so they both change. So okay. Uh, so if you get a let's say you get a permanent inflow of uh in, into let's say U.S. assets, let's say my Norwegian like sovereign wealth fund example from before, uh, and suppose that they buy like one percent of the uh, or let's say they buy two percent of the stock market, so prices go up go up by ten percent. Okay, then uh, what's going to happen is that the uh, expected returns are permanently going to be lower in each and every period in the future. Okay, but the impact on expected returns is much smaller. And so if prices go up by 10%, then expected returns go down by 10% times the dividend yield. So let's say the dividend yield is like 4%. Understood. Then the expected returns go down by just 40 basis points. And so if you go down just 40 basis points, I don't know, it, it, it takes like like a very, very long period of time for us to be able to, to detect that impact. Got it. So, so even though we really want to know what is the impact on sort of like the long run impact. So there's some papers who try to measure this um, up to one year out for individual securities. Um, but in our theory, it, it critically depends on whether the, the flows are permanent or whether they are transitory and the empirical literature kind of makes some distinction but but not but not always and so mm -hmm. um so that is and it also yeah so that is kind of like where the where we are with that so we quarterly uh, we can measure reasonably well uh, up to a year we see no mean reversion but then like confidence intervals get so wide that there's not a whole lot you can say do we know what causes flow uh, not yet. We're hopefully getting there. So, so we, what we've done is the following. So, so given that we have a new way of measuring flows, um, we try to implement that empirically uh, and say, like, what is the flow into the stock market? 
Now, the problem is that it's actually surprisingly hard because the data that you need for this is that for each and every investor, you need to know what is their new money that they allocate to all the asset classes. But the data that we have typically is either just equities or just for a small set of institutions like pension funds, we have both their like equity and fixed income and so on allocations. And that's really what we need for this. So we need to make some assumptions there. Um, and we try to measure flows into the into the stock market. We show that those are correlated with prices. And then um, we correlate it with two things. One is um, uh, macroeconomic fundamentals, so GDP growth and, and things like that. Um, that doesn't do a whole lot. Um, what does work very well is um, investors like survey expect, uh, survey based measures of expected returns. And so when you see that sort of investors' subjective expectations of returns uh, go up, that correlates quite strongly with our measure of flows. Um, but what is sort of like uh, perhaps most, uh, most interesting to us is we're now trying sort of in different settings um, to measure flows like closer to theory in, because in other countries, in particular in Europe, we have much better data on this. And we actually can measure flows more uh, more accurately. And then we can sort of answer some of those some of those questions. But um, the biggest question to us at this point that we're working on is of trying to understand like what drives flows, what are those shocks to latent demand, which is all kind of like one in the same one in the same hmm. theme. Interesting. That's what you're talking about earlier about relating it back to market efficiency. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. so the whole idea is going to be to try to understand like what drives shocks to financial markets, which of course lots of people have thought about. Um, but we think we're, I know this sort of like this approach gives you a new way to thinking about that. And then all of the answers can be a lot more nuanced in terms of like, is it all sentiment or is it all like an irrational hmm. flow? So it could be that some investors in some periods, even in some segments of the market, are more informed than than in others. Unreal. Is, is dividend policy still irrelevant to the valuation of shares if markets are inelastic? Uh, okay, it's another, it depends. So so that one could also change. Um, so mm. um, think of it as follows. So if you, um, if you do repurchases versus you pay out the dividend, then now it becomes relevant to what the investor is going to do uh, with that dividend. If the investor is going to eat the dividend and not reinvest it in markets, then dividend policy will not be neutral anymore. And so, um, so, so again, it's very hard to sort of like get good data on that to sort of know exactly like how much of the cash being paid out is being like reinvested. Um, but in principle, um, it could be the case that sort of like uh, dividend re- irrelevance is being broken by uh, by inelastic markets. And would that be a, a good thing or a bad thing for dividend focused investors? Um, that that part is not so obvious to me. I think sort of it's more that um, bigger picture. It sort of I think it changed like the way I would think about it more is that it actually has an impact on the firm's policies. So one of the things mm-hmm. that now changes is that um, um, if 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 your payout policy can have an impact on valuations, and obviously it may give firms an incentive to choose one versus one versus the other. Kind of in the same way, if you think about sort of like the whole, I don't know. Going back a little bit to the first part, if if you think about sort of like investors having um, a special demand for certain characteristics, let's say that investors really like firms that do a lot of R and D, or they really like firms that do a lot of investment, or that sort of like like expand globally. Well, that may give sort of like 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 firms um, uh, an incentive to sort of like undertake those corporate policies, and so it's not just sort of like an implication for investors. But actually, firms now facing sort of like inelastic markets where investors have an appetite for certain characteristics may actually change corporate policies to cater to that demand, and that may influence influence valuations. Hmm. So that's sort of like, um, I, I think, a more direct consequence. Um, depending on the outcome, it will also have an impact on sort of like expected returns, of course, of, of like firms, and hence for like investors who would like to hold dividend paying stocks but that really depends on how Mm. how large the effects are and and whether it's like relevant or not what role if any um does the increasing market share of cap weighted indices have in market elasticity um so at the level of the aggregate stock market like then if you just hold on to the market like weights of yeah. like everything, you provide no elasticity whatsoever. If you're just a buy and hold investor, 
Um, if you if you think about the level of the aggregate stock market uh, and you think about asset classes, the more common policy is to hold like fixed shares. Um, and then you provide some elasticity, but it's very low. Like So that was kind of like a, uh, you invest sort of like six trillion stocks, elasticity is like 0.4. Um, and and so so to the extent that more and more investors sort of like move, I know to buy, I don't know if it's really buy and hold, just hold the market portfolio across many asset classes or fixed shares, it makes it a lot easier for us to compute elasticity because mm. we know exactly what the elasticity is for those investors. Um, to what extent it makes the markets more or less elastic goes back to like what did they do? What did they do before? If the target date investors sort of attract the four one k sleepy investors, then it's going to make markets more elastic. If it came from investors who otherwise were much more like timing the markets, um, then, um, hmm. and then I think it's also like at a high level, I think sort of like the the deeper question is sort of why investors don't time the market more aggressively, right? I think that's sort of like um, um, like in terms of like like I don't know, why do we see sort of like like these fixed share allocations and why don't we see sort of investors like time the market more aggressively? And I think. Like the, I don't know, uh, lots of people have expressed this sort of idea that like okay, it's very hard to time markets. There's lots of uncertainty that comes with it, and faced with that uncertainty, like I know the best thing you can do is you just sort of like hold a fixed share, fixed share portfolio. Well, there's a flip side to that, and the flip side is that markets become very inelastic. I'm not sure I understand the implication there. Uh, so so suppose that like like before investors were trying to were trying to time the market, uh, and they thought like okay when. Um, when stock markets fall like like a lot, then we're gonna aggressively step in and, and things like that. Then you would provide more elasticity to the to the market. Now, if in reality, sort of it's very hard to time the market because there's so much uncertainty in whether like prices fall because of like fundamentals or because of like expected returns, then then it may be optimal, like for lots of institutional reasons, to just say, like, okay, at the level of asset classes, our strategic allocation as a pension fund is just like 60, 40 like stocks bonds. We revisit this like every five years, um, and and that's about that's about it. Well, that sort of like policy of fixing those shares, um, that leads to very inelastic markets because you mm. can't respond very much at the asset class level to movements in to movements in prices. Mm. And so, um, um, so yeah, so so there is sort of this. I think lots of people agree that sort of like timing markets is very is very difficult, and so there's a lot more sort of like cross sectional I know strategies and things like that. The implication of that is that sort of like if people don't time the market very aggressively, then we kind of like know directly what the implication is. And that's kind of like what our paper points out is that like these fixed share strategies, if that's what a lot of investors have gravitated towards, just because like it's hard to, to time the market, uh, consequence of that is the market's coming in the last. Hmm. Super interesting. Okay. Last question for you. Should, should individual retail investors, many of whom are listening to this podcast, should they behave any differently if markets are indeed inelastic? Um, no. And, and so, so, so I think that uh, not so much. So, uh, retail and, and institutional investors are like because it is not that um, like the fixed share sort of like allocation and not timing the market that may be the optimal thing to do faced with like a lot of uncertainty. If you don't know what, what expected returns are. At any given point, the optimal thing may be to just sort of hold a fixed share allocation or gradually trade back towards target. We're just sort of like drawing out those implications, but it doesn't mean that you can do much better. Hmm. And so I think sort of like the simple, uh, and this survey we've done a lot actually, uh, and, and also with like um, uh, with investors. It's sort of like, if you think about, I, I think the last year before, before um, uh, like in, in 2021, when markets like rally a lot, and you drifted away from your target allocation and you now think that expected returns are lower. So you were 60, 40, now you're like 70, 30, like, and like corporate bond returns over the year are pretty flat, like stock markets rallied. So you're kind of like out of line with your target. Like, what do you do? And so suppose that the expected return went on stocks went from five to two and a half percent. Then what most, what most people answer in that survey is like, oh, well, we would gradually trade back from like 70, 30, maybe to like I don't know, 65, 35, 60, 40. But very few will say like, oh, well, the equity risk premium went like in half. Before I was like 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 sixty forty, I should be thirty seventy now because the equity risk premium is much lower. Mm. And and but that's sort of kind of what the standard model would would, would imply. And so this this sort of notion that you gradually trade back to target um, because it's just probably hard to like know what expected returns are at any given point. Um, 
that that is sort of like that may well be the optimal thing the optimal thing to do and it means that um, markets are inelastic but there's not a whole lot you can do about it huh. the only thing that that I know, again like I think to the earlier discussion that we started with is sort of like the upside of all this but I'm not sure that's for retail investors um, the upside of all this is that it can make markets more understandable interpretable because we know like who's trading like who's who's, who's moving prices and then if you can forecast that demand then that can sort of help you to forecast forecast future returns and so there's the upside there um and that only works sort of in inelastic markets because otherwise the price impact of any any individual investor would be very very small and so that that sort of implication is there um but but in terms of like is there something you can do very differently just because you now know that markets are inelastic the answer is not so much <laughs> i'm afraid <laughs> Do you think we'll see like there there are all these factor investing products based on like the Fama French factors and other factor models? Will we see a, a I don't know a latent demand factor fund at some point? Um, I think if if it if it uh, uh, there's no I don't know, it's worth exploring. Let's put it like that. I think mm. it's like worth exploring to. Um, to think whether you can use sort of like like by forecasting, let me put it like this: the restrictions that you need under which you can bypass holdings and directly sort of go from characteristics to forecasting returns are pretty strong in the sense that investors need to be very much alike, so that the demand of different investors are not very relevant in forecasting future returns. Mm -hmm. Now, how large those gains are in practice. Uh, accounting for the uncertainty, have an estimation and 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 things like that that I don't that I don't know. But sort of yeah. like like one of that's and one of the things we're exploring now, more for the greater good and academic interest, is to sort of like understand whether like if you use some of those tools like we talked about before um, to forecast like latent demand and then forecast future returns, like like how much can you gain beyond directly forecasting forecasting returns. Hmm. Um, but there is obviously there's a lot of interest in the industry on studying flows and essentially what this provides is maybe a framework to say like well typical way of like i know there's lots of I don't know, we see them all the time in media like okay there's like large flows in this segment from this segment of the market or that segment we're essentially providing a framework to sort of like put all of that together and how it links to how it links to prices and so given that there's a lot of like attention on trying to use flows to forecast returns um uh, Perhaps there's something there that one can explore. Super interesting. We we do have one final question. I, I didn't send this one to you, so if you want to skip it, no worries. But we we typically ask all of our guests. I just forgot to include it. Um, how do you how do you define success in your life? Ah, okay, that's a big question. Uh, success is if I understand better, like like how financial markets work and how they interact with the macro economy. I think the bigger goal is to. Um, I think there's a lot of things in finance that we don't understand, like two basic questions, like why do markets go up and down? Like why do certain factors like earn high returns? And of course, lots of people have thought about that. Uh, and we're just trying to sort of like um, approach that from like this, this different angle by really starting at the investor level and bring in like a whole lot of new data to make I know, markets more understandable. And then sort of our next steps are going to be to connect that to the macro economy and global economy. So that's really where our research agenda is heading. And success would be is if we if we have this podcast again in, in 10 years and I can tell you a little bit more about how these things work, um, that will be success for me. Awesome. Great answer. Well, Ralph, this has been fantastic. I, I learned a ton going through your research and even more talking to you today. So really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Ralph.